first introduce the speakers. We're going to first introduce our speakers. We're going to watch the film that Richard made for us. We're going to engage in a little bit of conversation about um, agroecology, the importance of, of these grassroots solutions and how we communicate and tell stories about the, these impacts. And then we're going to have time to take questions from the audience. So um, I'd like to first welcome Rutendo. Thank you for joining us, Rutendo. Uh, Rutendo Zenda is a research and advocacy officer at the African Center for Biodiversity in South Africa. ACB is a partner of the Agroecology Fund. Rutendo has a background in agronomy. She's worked in the NGO sector for several years, and her focus has been on creating sustainable pathways for food security and eradicating hunger. ACB engages in research, analysis, advocacy, and amplifies the voices of social movements, fighting for food sovereignty in Africa. Their program areas include biosafety, genetic modification, and opposing corporate expansion in African agriculture. Hi, Rutendo. Hi, I'm Rita. Thank you so much for that introduction. Hello to everybody. It's so amazing to be with you again, to see old friends and old faces. So I'm very excited to be with you today. Thank you so much. Thank you for joining us. And next, we're also joined by Pius Rani. Pius is the executive director of the Northeast Slow Food and Agrobiodiversity Society in India. This is a biodiverse hilly region that's home to many indigenous communities and NESFAS enhances agroecology practices in this region. Uh, and they do this through school gardens, kitchen gardens, biodiversity walks with youth, linking farmers and researchers, um, documenting traditional knowledge. NESFAS has uh, introduced agroecology science in conventional curriculums in village schools. And they're also promoting the consumption of nutritionist, indigenous traditional foods um, in farmers markets and local cafes. Um, so welcome, Piers, thank you for joining us from Megalia. Hello, thank you so much for this opportunity. So I would like to share some of my thoughts here and then you know, also to learn from the other participants. Thank you so much for this uh, invitation, Amrita. And we are also joined by Anna LePay. Thank you for joining us, Anna. Anna is a national best-selling author, a leading advocate for sustainability and justice along the food chain, and an advisor to funders investing in food systems transformation. Anna is the director of the Food Sovereignty Fund at Ponterea Foundation, which is a donor to AEF. And with her team at Real Food Media, Anna works with grassroots organizations to strengthen their storytelling capacity and create powerful movement building media. Real Food Media has produced short videos taking on big food myths and also developed the largest international short films competition on food farming and sustainability. Anna, thank you for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me. It's great to be here. Thanks. And we also have Daniel Moss, uh, our co-director at the Agroecology Fund. Um, Daniel actually trained as a community organizer and he strengthened uh, tenant organizations in public housing in Boston. And he also spent some time many years in El Salvador and Mexico, uh, working very closely with social movements, defending rights to land and water. In addition to his uh, work with the Agroecology Fund, he collaborates with the Equitable Food Initiative as an on-farm trainer um, and with Latin American water utilities to strengthen watershed conservation strategies. Daniel, hi, <laughs> welcome. Good day, everybody. Thank you so much, Amrita. Look forward to the conversation. And last but not least, it's my honor to introduce Rucha. Rucha Chitnis is a fe feminist photojournalist and an emerging award-winning filmmaker. Rucha is committed to amplifying the wisdom and solutions from frontline movements. She's the communications director at the Grassroots Global Justice Alliance and a fellow of the International Women's Media Foundation. She consults as a narrative and visual storytelling strategist with progressive funders, grassroots organizations, and documentary film projects. And Rucha is also a digital storytelling advisor with Vikalp Sangam, which is a uh, people-centered platform for alternatives in India. Rucha, thank you for joining us today. Namaste and salam. Hi, everyone. It's great to be here. 
and good to see so many colleagues who we met with India in India a few just like last year. So without further ado, let's watch this beautiful video that Rucha has spent so much time and effort and care and love producing for the Agroecology Fund. in a just way in Africa. Agroecology is uh, farmers becoming scientists. Agroecology is para los jóvenes. Agroecology is science practice and movement. La agroecología une a la gente con sus recursos. It's the realization of farmers' rights. Agroecology is the solution for gender equity. I'm here in India um, with, uh, with, for the Agroecology Learning Exchange. People that are working on the ground with farmers, farmer organizations, the funding community, uh, and a real activists that are really hoping for change and rooting for something that we all believe in. Doesn't matter, I'm letting nature go into do the work. The Agroecology Fund is a movement, a force of donors, people with resources that want to help a vibrant agroecology movement around the world. A great opportunity for people to help a movement that's going to help our planet, our food system, our communities defend their rights and get nourishing food. The impact I'm seeing with the collaborative supported by the Agroecology Fund is that it gives an opportunity to farmers at different levels to collaborate. So if you have a researcher, you have a farmer, you have an advocacy um, organization, and that there is a, the whole thing that you need really to create evidence, that the evidence will feed the advocacy at the level so that policy change can happen. This pandemic exposes so much weakness in the globalized food system. We have to invest in local bottom-up solutions. The farmers and allies we support are creatively and urgently leading the way to healthy diets and a healthy planet. Uh, every living uh, being has got the right to live. Uh, we don't uh, use pesticides or insecticides to kill them. The uh, industrial model of agriculture that is based on the use of uh, synthetic fertilizers and pesticides, it has different limitations. First of all, it's damaging the environment. We have whole areas that are polluted, people that are being poisoned by pesticides. Uh, where we are going is very much unpredictable, you know? Resilience is based on producing for this unpredictable world. Small landholders, small farmers, subsistence agriculture feeds the majority of the world. And industrial agriculture feeds corporations. Las comunidades somos cuatro comunidades de pueblos indígenas. Son quechua hablantes y este, trabajamos más que todo, dedicamos a cultivo de papa. Tenemos 1,300 variedades de papas nativas. Eh, definitivamente es más que todo trabajamos para soberanía alimentaria, una conservación, uh, área conservación biocultural indígena. Agroecological products also are very, um, are very important to women. They can feed their families, they can sell the surplus. So this is why agroecology is important. The knowledge is there and it gives power and leadership to women. When we do this exercise or mapping exercise, we are uh, asking the communities what are those species which are climate resilient and then which are those species which are rich in micronutrients. Through this uh, initiative, we want young people uh, you know, to engage with uh, other livelihood activities that come out you know, from these agroecological practices. Through agroecology, the farmers around the world are building a new world which can combat climate change. So the restoration of land through agroecology, the restoration of traditional livelihoods, the defense of communities, that is 
the, the fundamental strategic point of intervention if we care about the long-term health of the planet, future generations, and even the climate. I'm very, very much hopeful. Uh, one, because a lot of governments are turning their attention to agroecology. Ten African countries are developing an agroecology policy. We are seeing now that a number of uh, international donors are uh, starting to invest more in agroecology or at least are putting agroecology on the top of their agenda. And what we need to do is to really accelerate and amplify that. There is sort of a place at the table for so many different kinds of funders, no matter what your passion is or what sort of door you're entering into this big systems change. You know, if you're passionate about protecting the rights of indigenous peoples, if you're passionate about uh, protecting biodiversity, if you are passionate about um, land reform and farmers' rights, if you're uh, passionate about economic development and uh, reducing inequality in the world, that there is a place for you at this table because agroecology is a way in to solve so many of those complex problems. Tens of thousands of farms like this in the UK. There's never been a more important moment to invest in agroecology, and never been a moment where that investment can yield such important dividends for creating the new kind of food system that we need in the 21st century and beyond, for a food system that's based in good nutrition, healthy environment, human rights of communities, biodiversity. I fight for agroecology for my daughters, for my future daughters, Uh, para todo mundo, que nós tenhamos um planeta saudável, uh, livre de agrotóxicos, uh, livre de transgenia, que nós possamos levar a agroecologia para dentro também das academias, para que elas consigam estudar e também tornar a ciência concreta. Nobody hungry. That's, uh, that's the dream. If we can feed the world, if we can have a world where we are so connected in the way we produce our food, environmentally friendly, where we, it is beyond our place, it is beyond our small fields, it is, it is coming together and just reclaiming our dignity and humanity. Thank you so much, Rucha. I hope you feel a sense of like joy that we're able to share this now with the community. Um, we're so thrilled. Um, Daniel, would you say a few words about why this was so important for the Agroecology Fund um, sure. to work with Rucha to produce this video? Um, yeah, and just, wow. Thank you again, Rucha, for this beautiful production really captured the diversity of voices and oh, the, the, the power of us coming together to make this transformation. And I, I think that that was really the genesis of this is that, right, I mean, we, we talk about accompanying the agroecology movement, the agroecology movements, and it's a diversity of movements in every corner of the globe that expresses itself differently. And we had this unique opportunity where we brought ourselves together to India to learn from one another and to learn about the, the fascinating work, important work that's going on in India. Um, so we thought we'd uh, yeah, ask Richard to come along and to, to put voices together from people to capture the various approaches, the ways that people are advancing in agrobiodiversity and climate resilience and women's rights and land defense, et cetera. So um, that was really the genesis to kind of to lift up this idea of collaboration that we really need to come together and bring together the various voices because that's what's really going to be necessary to make this transformation. Um, And so we wanted to convey, you know, the, the urgency and make an audience familiar with the kind of 
impacts that agroecology has, the kind of cross-sectional impacts across human rights, climate change, biodiversity, et cetera. So um, unique opportunity to bring ourselves together. And thank you so much, Rucha, for, for pulling it into a, a coherent whole. And, you know, and we're recognizing the Agroecology Fund that you know, there are tremendous communication tools built by partners and allies across the world. And this is one more. And what we're looking for is we know that we don't have the lobbying, the communications budget of you know, the agro industry sort of bro broadly writ around the globe, but we know that the, the, the power of our messaging um, and our representation and stories and our evidence um, is what will really help us uh, push forward the transformation. So thank you. Um, and I'm jumping in now with a quick question also for Rucha. Um, could you tell us a little bit more about why this was a meaningful project for you um, and maybe some memorable moments that, that stay in your mind from the interviews, all of the footage that you filmed? Um, yeah, could you take us back to that process? Thank you so much, Amrita, and thank you so much, Daniel. I really want to apologize because I'm a little bit under the weather and I hope you can understand what I'm saying. Um, firstly, I feel so emotional because the last time I was in India was for this convening, right? Um, and it's important to remember like right after the convening ended, the world at large went into a lockdown. And several months later, we saw one of the most incredible, powerful uprising of farmers in India, right? All of which, this fight against privatization, this fight against neoliberalization, the dehumanization of farmers, all of which, which was named at the convening. Um, one of the things I really remember uh, was this quote from Chuki, and she said that, you know, agroecology is not about a technique, it's about a constructive resistance, and it's about reclaiming the rights of farmers, reclaiming our seeds. And it's really about recognizing the protagonism of farmers, right? We have this phenomena of feminization of agriculture, but what the industrial media narrative has done is dehumanization, right? And amplifying this false narrative, uh, which I call like beware of Tina, which is there is no alternative. But what was so clear in this convening, because you had 100 people from 30 countries, you had farmers, you had um, pastoral communities, you had scientists, you had donor co-conspirators, right? Was that um, really smashing and dismantling the mythology of the dominant culture, right? Which erases the traditional ecological knowledge of farmers and creates this illusion of scarcity, right? But I think what was incredible about being in my motherland uh, being hosted by Amrita Bhumi in, and seeing that incredible harvest ceremony, right? We were all there for that harvest ceremony was to recognize the power of the resilience and that this is a movement, right? And we don't actually have to reinvent the wheel. These solutions have existed for a very long time. And one of the things I remember was a quote from Gopal and he said that so much about agroecology is remembering mm. because we have forgotten we have forgotten about these knowledge systems, right? And so during COVID, one of the incredible examples of resilience we saw was from Dalit and Adivasi women farmers in Telangana, who, because they had reclaimed their food system, their power, and really completely transformed, talk about self-determination of their food system, they had food sovereignty during COVID. They were not only able to feed their families, they were able to feed their communities and they launched into mutual aid. So that is the power of agroecology. Um, yeah, and I just wanna thank, thank the fund for giving me this opportunity and for bringing us all together because so much of our narrative work is challenging that, that the, 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 the narrative of the dominant culture. And it's important to understand is like who profits and benefits from that normalization, right? And so we collectively are doing this work of myth busting, right? The, the story of industrial agriculture. Um, yeah, it was incredibly inspiring and it's so lovely to see you all again. Thanks so much, Rucha, and thank you so much for getting us centered also in the moment, the moment today and the moment of what's been happening in the world since we did meet, uh, I guess it's a year and a half ago now. Uh, Amrita, could you show a quick uh, slide of- Yeah, Catherine, Did sorry, could you share screen please?
Yeah, I just wanted to share just a, a quick image and, and remembrance of a, a dear colleague who was with us in India, um, a, a, a colleague of the um, Amrita Bhumi Agroecology School, um, and this is Nanjuna Swami, um, who is an artist and expressed himself through his, his graphic art, uh, another important way to communicate about, about agroecology. And I just, just if a quick uh, moment of silence to remember Nanjuna Swami and all of our friends and family that have uh, perished and gotten sick during this uh, pandemic. We remember you, Nijanda Swami, and thank you for your work. Thank you, Amita. Um, and I think um, taking that moment, the, the, the point that we spoke about this year and how I think we're all feeling a little fragile with all of the um, the losses that we've faced and the, the challenges that have been nonstop. And I'd like to pose this question to Rutendo and Pierce now. Um, you know, in the midst of all of this hardship, could you tell us a little bit more about your work and the region that you work in and, and perhaps something that's made you feel that there's, you know, hope and positivity um, and resilience through your work? Um, if you could share an example or a story or anything like that. Uh, Rutendo, would you like to go first? Um, thank you so much, Amrita, and my apologies. I have to, um, uh, not to be on video, to stabilize my connection. Uh, first of all, I'd like to say to Richa, well done for such beautiful work. I think um, I was actually tearing up through that video. What powerful voices that came out. And it is at a time where we need all the hope that we can get as the world faces such a big pandemic and so much loss, I think this is one thing that really has given up, give, given me at a personal level so much hope that you know we can reclaim our humanity and our dignity, and there is really hope. Um, just to uh, just to share that um, um, Amrita has already shared um, a, a little bit of uh, of what ACB does. Um, my name is Rutendo Senda, and I'm with the African Center for Biodiversity and based in Johannesburg. A lot of our work is around movement building and advocacy and sharing and catalyzing collective, collective action and influence decision making on issues around biosafety, agricultural biodiversity, and farmer managed seed systems. Um, I think COVID was a wake up call for all of us. We had to really reimagine our global food systems where we really saw that we need to start to really look local. Our farmers are able to feed us. They were able to feed not only their families, but to feed communities at a time where everything came to a standstill. I think it was really humbling that we, we really come back to our roots and see our farmers for, for as right holders, as also as the people that you know, we, you know, at, at most of times their rights are not even um, in, in conversations. But these are the people that really came up to the world and and showed us that they can they can feed the world. I just really like also to share uh, maybe uh, a case study uh, on some of our work in, that happened during um, in 2019. ACB works with partners across Africa, um, and one of our partners in Zimbabwe called Turo Trust. They embarked on a, a, a case, a, a study, uh, which was a multidisciplinary study that they took after the region was hit badly by two side by two cyclones that came probably just weeks um, after another. So Cyclone Idai and Cyclone Kenneth that really devastated the region, especially in Zimbabwe, Mozambique, and Malawi. And um, uh, the, this project that they did was to try and. Um, um, and understand the causes and the impacts of the disaster, but also to inform a recovery, uh, recovery and development options where farmers were really central to that process. Um, and, and, and at the moment, the government of Zimbabwe has started to really engage and adopt to and align to most of agroecology concepts. Uh, and farmers are also involved in a seed restoration uh, project that is happening currently. I think for us, this was really, really important for ACB and the region because there was a lot of recognition of farmer managed seed systems and also the implementation of farmers' rights. So seeing farmers being central to 
um, a project or a process of um, disaster management that can be pushed through policy processes both at national and regional level was very, very important for us. Um, and we continue to showcase these stories through our publications, through our research, and through our, all our, our, our communication and media platforms. So uh, uh, please do look at our website, please look at the Tsuro website and be able to see some of these success stories where agroecology continues to demonstrate uh, and show the resilience of um, not only uh, uh, landscapes, but also of livelihoods. So thank you so much, Amrita. Thanks, Rutendo. Thanks for sharing that. Um, and I'd, I'd like to pose the same question uh, to Pius now about, um, you know, if you could share with us some examples of resilience uh, that you've seen in your communities. Um, yes. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Amrita and then uh, Daniel Moss. And then thank you so much, uh, Rucha, for that, uh, you know, very beautiful video. And then it's really an inspiring video you know, to all of us. So uh, to come to your question, Amrita, let me just be specific here. Uh, uh, we work in uh, with 130 villages uh, covering six indigenous communities in Northeast India, which is one of the world's hotspot of biodiversity. Uh, our work uh, mainly focuses on defending and promoting indigenous food systems. And we uh, strongly believe uh, in the importance of agro biodiversity for increased ecological resilience food and nutrition security and sustainable livelihood. And that agroecology for us is the pathway towards that uh, aspect. Uh, some of the uh, recent or specific uh, success or uh, the impacts that uh, I want to share with you uh, regarding the how agroecology is a true grassroots solution in our region. So uh, there are three key examples that I would like to share here with you. Uh, number one is, uh, we have this agroecology learning circles, which are basically an autonomous space for committee member to committee member reflection. In this group, uh, they follow the intercultural approach in addressing the concerns relating to indigenous food system by following the principle of agroecology. And one success that we can uh, clearly see here is the confidence level gained by farmers, and most importantly, the acknowledgement by scientists of their practice. Uh, initially, we uh, we started with uh, just 29, and now we are in touch with the local government here to upscale this initiative in at least 100 communities. So uh, this is uh, one uh, key achievements that you know we can see even the government are looking to this aspect. And then second one, then uh, the mapping exercise of the local biodiversity, uh, which we found out that the average number of uh, food plants per village is 202. Wow. And this has made many stakeholders to understand their importance looking from nutrition, climate, and food security point of view. Uh, you know, this work has been acknowledged by the local administration in, in many of the districts here, which, which some of the policymakers now are inviting us for a dialogue to take this forward. I hope, you know, this pandemic also has given this, uh, this opportunity for us uh, to strengthen these agroecology practices here. And then number three, uh, one of the challenges which everyone of us are facing also, how do we uh, engage young people into this whole aspect of uh, movement building then? So uh, I somehow, you know, this pandemic has really given us the opportunity to reach out to many young people. Why? Because, you know, because of the lockdown, many of them, they come back to their own communities. This is the, the best opportunity for us where we were able to advocate the importance of indigenous food system. Initially, we, uh, we, just, uh, we just have with us like 100 young people, but now we have a bigger group, more than 2000. So uh, we have introduced uh, also a local fellowship program. So I would like to uh, uh, you know, give a special uh, thanks also to our mentor, our founder, Mr. Frank Roy. Uh, so he initiated this international local fellowship program. And then now we have this local fellowship program, which enable us to demonstrate that agroecology is a pathway for the well-being. We could see the vibrant among these young people, how they interact you know, among themselves, among the communities, and most importantly, they, they, they are the leaders in their own respective communities. Thank you, Amita. Thanks so much for sharing, Pius. Um, and to Anna now, 
Um, Anna, from your perspective, um, especially with what Rutendo, Rucha, Pius, everyone has mentioned about, you know, the context of, of perhaps the pandemic showing, showing us that the current system is deeply flawed and, you know, we can't continue like this. What do you feel right now in this moment is so key to counter that dominant narrative that still exists um, and, and amplify agroecology in the circles to funders, to, to decision makers? Thanks, Amrita. And, and again, thank you all for being here. And it was so, uh, I've been so emotional on this whole uh, conversation so far. Rusha, seeing those images again, it just brought me right back uh, to being all together and what an incredible experience that was. And, and to think about what we all have been through as a global community uh, since and um, all of the, the trauma. Um, and yes, of course, this pandemic has exposed uh, so much of the uh, ways in which the industrial food system has failed us. But of course, we had many signals <laughs> even before the pandemic. And yet there was such and has been and continues to be such entrenched power reinforcing the status quo. And as Rusha said, kind of pushing this narrative that there is no alternative. And I think what I have really learned from uh, the uh, folks like you've just heard from and from many of the other people who uh, are part of the Agroecology Fund grantee community and uh, movement leaders around the world is that there is absolutely an alternative. And the reason why more of us aren't seeing it and more policymakers aren't supporting it is precisely because of the entrenched economic interests in an industrial food system that is heavily reliant, as you heard Emil say in the video on synthetic fertilizers and pesticides uh, and other inputs that are you know, a significant uh, industry globally. And so, you know, I do think there is this opportunity. I, I, I'm coming today with my funder hat on, um, but to really think about how can we amplify this story of the agroecology and grassroots solutions stories to combat the underinvestment from both public and private sectors. Uh, uh, the fact that, you know, I think it's less than 5% of public dollars goes toward agroecological research globally, it's totally mind boggling. Um, and secondly, how can we expose uh, the incredible corporate influence on some of our public institutions and, and really through that exposure, try to uplift again, agroecological solutions. So uh, funder colleagues, some of whom are on this, this call now have been part of a, a global response to an, a, a partnership announced last year between the pesticide industry lobbying group CropLife and FAO uh, to say, you know, what we need is not a partnership at the highest level between FAO and a pesticide industry trade group. What we need is an independent FAO that really represents uh, the public good. And the third thing I think that we can really do as advocates within and without uh, philanthropy is to expose where philanthropic dollars are being misdirected right now and to really uh, talk about, again, the benefits of agroecology. And I think about, I, I'm sure some of you might have seen Bill Gates's most recent book. And uh, I was struck that in his chapter on food, if you've seen it, you know, the one photograph he has in that chapter is him standing in front of a synthetic fertilizer plant in India. Uh, uh, and so we can see that, you know, with uh, foundations like the Gates Foundation really, again, misdirecting their dollars toward these uh, uh, misguided solutions when, of course, we know what power agroecology and agroecological solutions hold to really address the, the complexity of our systems and uh, not create any unintended consequences or not exacerbate climate change, exacerbate inequality and food insecurity. So I do feel uh, that there is this incredible opportunity. And I think that through um, through kind of mechanisms like the Agroecology Fund, our voice can be amplified. And through films like Rusha's that we can share, this message can be, uh, can be amplified. And that's you know really, really critical piece of the solution. Thanks, Anna. And, and just as you said, that critical piece of that solution with the Agroecology Fund, I think that the way that we framed it is looking at our strategic directions, of course, shifting the, the narrative and correcting, if you will, um, this, this conversation about food and hunger. But of course, tied to that strategic direction is the goal to move more money into agroecology, as you said, because the you know, it's not an even playing field at all. We're talking a fraction um, of the uh, billions that go towards industrial agriculture. So I want to take this question to Daniel, um, if you could speak a little bit more about what AEF is sort of strategizing towards in terms of moving money, big money to towards agriculture. 
Thanks, Amrita. Yeah, as you know, um, we need massive investment in agroecology, and, and Anna pointed out, uh, you know, that agroecology receives a pittance of, of public dollars in terms of investment in research, for example, and not to mention all of the, 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 the huge uh, percentage of money that goes into subsidies um, of uh, conventional production uh, that ends up making the uh, the industrial food much more much cheaper to consumers when in fact there's all these hidden costs that we're all paying for. Um, so let's shift that subsidy structure, the kind of work that the, uh, the ACB, that the African Center for. Well, I'm sorry, was I muted? Yeah, I lost you for a second. No, uh, not the whole. Okay, <laughs> apologies there. Um, I like the way you phrased it, Anna, that there's so much kind of purposeful obfuscation or misdirection of resources, um, and I think that's exactly what the point of effective communications products are communication products that are then you know used in the course of advocacy and communications and education so we all know that the you know you can make a nice video but you know that only it goes so far uh you need a coherent strategy for who well back you know backing up a little bit who are you making it for for what purpose what are you trying to influence what are you trying to get uh, whether it's a policymaker or a neighborhood farmer to do and we're really happy in the agroecology fund to have that be a core part of our work which is to accompany our partners in in, in strengthening their communications capacities so that they can reach the audiences that they need to reach um, and those are a variety of audiences and we we, we already uh, we're so honored to support organizations like Nesfas and ACB that have really these excellent communications products. You know, I've seen both of them that really, you know, are, are depart from, you know, a, a, a coherent strategy about who are we trying to influence and what sort of um, story do we need to pull together to make a difference. And yet at the end of the day, we need to move massive investment into agroecology. And so we need to move um, our policymakers, we need to move our national governments, we need to move philanthropy, we need to move the bilateral and multilateral development agencies. And each of these, you know, have slightly different messaging, some tied more to the sustainable development goals. We have opportunities coming up now with the UN Food System Summit, with the climate change talks. There's a lot of money out there, frankly. Um, and we, rather than have it be misdirected, we need to show the efficacy, the the, the moral imperative, the, the, the climate resiliency necessity to invest in agroecology now. Um, so we, we really look forward to continue to accompany our partners in, in, in identifying the communications tools they need to reach their audience and to engender this kind of uh, big movement of resources into agroecology. Thanks, Daniel. Um, and that leads me to my question, both again to Ruchendo and to Pius about these communications tools uh, with AC Bio and, and NESFAS working very much as grassroots groups, um, amplifying it, uh, you're amplifying your work within your constituency to local policymakers, having that dialogue with authorities um, and changing policy. Could you share a little bit about what you found to be effective um, in terms of your communication strategies? Um, in, in, in the space that you work. Um, yes. thank you so, yeah. 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 yeah, thank you so much, Amrita. I think um, in the face of COVID-19 and all the lockdowns that prevented us to have face-to-face -face interaction, um, I think social media and online, meet, online meeting platforms really um, took a stand. I think social media rapidly transformed uh, a platform for, for new convergences and for new, you know, taking activism to a center stage where we could use the different platforms to really share our political beliefs and educating others. I think for ACB, one of the things that we actively started to embark on um, is what we call teach-ins, which really provided, you know, a platform to us to to, to tackle different you know, different topics and have experts also share on those platforms provide a better understanding of the current issues um, that were also like real threats um, to, 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 our, to, our, to our, our campaigns. And also like, you know, also presenting on different opportunities uh, and, 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 and things that are happening at international levels, at the CBD level, you know, we really started to bring some of these conversations back into um, um, our local groups and all our local partners that we work with so that we can start to really uh, have this, you know, push back against the things that we we want to push back against. So I think for us, uh, the 
as much as they were presented a lot of challenges, I think our communication strategies really amplified during this time. We really could uh, started to use social media more. We started to really focus more on um, you know capturing powerful image and 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 sharing powerful videos on on farmer stories. So this is some of the things that we we have also been doing. Thanks, Rutendo. Yes, and we've we've tried to share some of those powerful videos. They are indeed powerful. Um, Pius, over to you. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much, Amrita, for uh, that question. Uh, our communication and outreach mainly uh, prioritize uh, on communication for the communities. Uh, here at Nesfas, uh, when we speak, uh, even in our communications and outreach, we speak as part of our communities as one voice telling our story. So uh, we try to amplify our voice in different kind of uh, um, medium. We have like press, we, are, we, we build that kind of relationship with them. And then uh, we also pro, you know, at, the, at the community level, and you know, we have this poster campaign where we document and circulate all the various experiments in relation to agroecology through pests, soil, and seeds. And then we also have these local events like the uh, uh, farmers market, uh, the, and then we also have the seed fair, the exchange visits, where we utilize these events as a way to promote the agroecology. And then we have this young team with us also who are uh, moving from one village to the other village, uh, doing the video documentation. So we have also uh, this uh, grassroots kind of uh, journalist with us, helping us to capture the stories and tell us, and then we we flash out, you know, in various social media, uh, I mean, in different social uh, uh, media. And then uh, we also have a website whereby uh, we aim, especially during the last year during the pandemic when the lockdown was launched. So uh, we aim to at least get uh, 10 stories a month. So that is the target. Those stories are basically the stories, you know, from the communities to tell us about, you know, their experience or, you know, the, the, the strengths of their own uh, local biodiversity. So these stories has really, you know, uh, brought a huge, huge impact, you know, to a number of people, uh, you know, especially, you know, to the to the larger audience. And then uh, through social media, we are growing significantly. In terms of uh, last year, uh, we grow a, a very huge number. We have more than a lot of followers with us. So this has been uh, fantastic to see. And then a number of young people also getting engaged, you know, with our social media. And then uh, we could also see other uh, non, uh, you know, uh, non-partner uh, uh, communities also now started you know to engage with us we could see that you know there's a huge kind of uh, uh, you know uh, i mean like kind of uh, active participation from their side and then one thing also i would like to share here with you about you know sometimes we tend to ignore these traditional forms of communication which is basically vital for agroecology which we learn through our experience we have this couplet in our uh, in our in, in here in among the indigenous communities we have this couplet we call in Hasik power, whereby farmers or group of farmers, they perform and share the perception of uh, farm, of uh, traditional farming and agroecology through couplets. So basically uh, they do like a kind of a soup uh, couplet in relation to agroecology. This has, you know, big, you know, has got a big hit, you know, among the young people whereby, you know, they learn something about, you know, uh, the, the, the local agroecology that, that is there in, the, in, in their own communities. And then we also see a number of, uh, of uh, publications also, which we try you know, to translate into local languages. So this is this is also quite interesting, you know, to see. And then uh, the first thing here also uh, that we need to do is uh, how do we make people realize the significance of their own biodiversity, especially among young people. This is this is the challenge that we are facing. But uh, uh, we have been able, you know, to do that by having a creative, you know, idea here. So. Uh, once the momentum is there, it is quite easy as the confidence of people, you know, have been built there. So, um, uh, so I see, you know, this is the this is the way that you know we can uh, we can expand our uh, networks through different kind of uh, social media platform that we have, and then we could see now young people they are started questioning, you know, uh, even in the local, uh, uh, you know, uh, in I mean in the social media that we have. So we kind of share, you know, this news. So this is, you know, what we are uh, what we are uh, doing, Amita. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, incredible agents of change, youth. Um, and before we go to questions, because I'm mindful of the time here, I want to quickly ask Krucha one last thing, um, which is tying into your work now as comms director 
at DGJ Alliance um, and your filmmaking work, both of which you know are so deeply rooted in social justice and, and people's power. Um, could you speak a little bit about you know the communication, the, the tools that you find most effective um, when, when you are trying to, to tell these stories? Thanks, Amrita. Um, yeah, I mean, I think what we're all collectively doing is we're trying to change the conversation, right? Uh, we are collectively working to sort of transform the mainstream media to recognize, right, the protagonism, the agency of peasants, of food producers. Um, and I think what was very clear in the India convening was like, what are we saying yes to? What are we saying yes to? What are the real solutions and what are the false solutions, right? Like net zero, for example, or smart agriculture. Um, and so much of the dominant narrative is about dehumanization. It is about the erasure of the knowledge system of farmers, of grassroots and community-led solutions, right? And what we witnessed in India was that unity and struggle, right? And we saw that the crisis of that the farmers face in India is connected with the crises in Philippines, is connected with the crises that farmers are facing in Brazil, for example. Um, I mean, in terms of a narrative strategy, I look at like, I take inspiration from agroecology, right? Agroecology is about abundance, right? It is about diversity and celebration of cultures, right? Um, and there are diversity of stories, right? Um, like the potato farmers who shared like this conserving 1500 varieties of potatoes, for example. Um, and so in terms of storytelling, what is really important is to strive for a world where the mainstream media starts to look at farmers as women farmers as expert analysts right not some guy sitting in zurich or bill gates who has become like the expert source for everything from vaccines to covid to agriculture um, one of the examples i wanted to share firstly i really appreciated everything that pews said right because it is about the the voices the story of communities it is about diversity of ways in which those stories are shared, right? Um, Deccan Development Society is an incredible example where Dalit women farmers, they have trained them to become videographers and documentarians. So they are shaping their own narrative. They are really creating their own stories and smashing the mythology of the green revolution in India, right? And the, um, and the complete disdain to women's knowledge systems. And so I think what others have been saying is like resourcing indigenous storytellers, um, resourcing, <clears throat> having a multi-pronged strategy. Um, and really, I think there's so much of the work is to do with, is like chip away with the mainstream media, right? On, on who is considered an expert. Right. So um, yeah, I mean, those are some of the ideas that come to my mind. So true, Rucha, thank you. And I think that's even with AEF's um, communication focus, it's, it's that who are we asking? Who are we amplifying? And you know, why is there only certain kind of voices that are still legitimate? So let's change that. Um, and we are seeing a lot of questions come in in the chat. So I'm going to read out a few. Um, okay, so question to Daniel and Anna. Uh, what do you say to critiques? This is from Margarita Fernandez. What do you say to critiques, especially from the philanthropy world, um, that agroecology is too ideological or that it is um, counterproductive to present agroecology and corporate agriculture as a binary? Um, so yes, big question to start with, but yes, let's move. Daniel and Anna. Well, I can jump in and I'm also looking at the clock. So this, this question we could spend, you know, a whole, a whole year diving into, but, but just briefly, what I would say is that I think that what I'm hearing from uh, when I talk about agroecology in philanthropy circles in the U S uh, it is, it is from those who are questioning it. Yes. A bit of this sort of it, it's ideological, but what's underneath that critique is a, uh, an assumption that sort of it's not it's not a, it's not a, a real solution. And what I have seen as a powerful way to respond to that is to bring in the stories, the stories that 
you know, Risha shared in this video, the stories of the, the, the partners that Agroecology Fund is supporting, the stories of these social movements around the world to really kind of, again, chip away at that dominant misunderstanding that uh, we can continue with an industrial model of agriculture and still feed ourselves into the future. And I think that what we are uh, now have, even more than we have ever had, is really powerful evidence about how, how damaging the industrial model is. You know, the end of last year, Pesticide Action Network uh, released, uh, uh, did this peer reviewed study that looked at, for the first time ever, a comprehensive assessment of pesticide poisoning of populations working on farms and found that 44% of people working on farms around the world have at least one incident of pesticide poisoning a year. I mean, that is a completely unsustainable model when nearly half of the people who are bringing us our food are being poisoned by the chemicals they're using. And, you know, that's just one, one fact, one example. But I think that we have now, uh, as a network, as uh, uh, thanks to researchers around the world, such powerful evidence about how damaging this model is to biodiversity, to public health, to economic development, and so on. And now, again, thanks to powerful research, including some groups uh, and institutions that the Agroecology Fund has supported, and powerful evidence that agroecology kinds of work that you're seeing Rotenda P is talking about is really addressing these underlying root causes of, of what's so unsustainable about our industrial food system. Great, I, I don't have anything to add. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the damning evidence is not ideological. It's, it's evidence that points to the need for an urgent change. Thanks, Daniel. Thanks, Anna. And uh, I'm looking at the chat now. We do have a question from Pepe uh, for Pius and Ritendo both, and a similar question from Suamba. So I'll combine them. Um, could you talk more about the engagement of young people and the need to bring them on board as, as um, change agents? How do you achieve that? Um, and to Pius, what were your strategies to attract young people to your program? So youth. How do we involve them? OK, so uh, so let me try and answer that uh, uh, that question. Uh, so uh, the strategy to attract young people, it's basically uh, this is what, you know, based on our uh, uh, on our uh, kind of engagement with young people. One of the strategies that we have been, uh, you know, uh, become quite successful is about, you know, and you know, making use of the traditional forms of communication. So that's the first thing you know that we do. Sometimes you know we tend to ignore you know these little things you know, but they are quite quite effective. You know, if if you if you look you know from that perspective, for example, you know we organize a number of campaigns and then a singing competition. For example, young people from different rural areas they come together in one common cluster and then you know sing about you know local food sing about you know local biodiversity all this kind of the idea that we that that we that we brought in one common platform and then bring about the traditional um, uh, you know instruments along with the dance so you know this kind of experience we had also introduced to daniel moss during his visit to our region here you could see you know how even children you know they 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 they, they, they came and i mean they come and participate on that platform and then the second aspect here also i would like to uh, uh, like to mention here is about you know when you talk about you know this uh, uh, you know young people becoming attractive uh, towards the the, the healthy diets the local food so it has to be sexy you know in a way uh, so uh, how do we do that then so uh, we kind of involve like chef yeah chef you know uh, chef from the local area we take them to the to the home field to the party field to the forest and then do the foraging with us and then we ask them we give them the challenge this is the this is the diversity that we have can you innovate something on 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 the on the on the on this particular plant so that you know it will attract young people on that basis then you know we have this uh, what we call as the cooking demonstration campaign we have the cooking uh, competition whereby we allow young people to to cook by themselves you know based on these ingredients under the guidance of this professional chef so these are just two examples that i would like to share but there are lots more to be shared maybe uh, you know if you are interested more you know you can reach out to me and then we can exchange ideas thank you Thanks, Pius. Um, and uh, I hope people are following the chat because there's a lot of great resources that people have been dropping links and, uh, you know, what to follow on Twitter, websites. Um, and I think we also had a question from Biju. Uh, there was, 
he did have his hand up, but now does not. Um, if there's no more questions, I'm going to ask Daniel to please, um, you know, say some final words and, and wrap up. It's been such a wonderful session. Um, oh, yes, we do have a question. Is it Jose? Could you, could you, sure, unmute, unmute your mic and, and ask the question quickly. Yeah, thank you. I had a question for Anna, as you mentioned. My name is Suma. I'm from Makam, India. Uh, greetings to everybody. This is such an enriching discussion. I had a question for Anna about the point she made about FAO and its independent functioning and uh, its current, um, you know, the challenges uh, there. How, how do we influence that? What are the processes ongoing? Perhaps we need a separate discussion. But can we use the mail link that you've put us all on together to actually talk about this more in depth and how we can all work towards that more strategically? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Soma. And this is a great segue to Daniel, who will close us off to say that uh, we will definitely uh, send out an email to everybody who is here on the line, everybody who registered. You'll get a follow-up email. You'll have in that a link to the video. It's also been put in the chat, but a link to this video so you can share it, some ideas for how to share it. And then specifically to your question, Soma, we'll be sure to include, I've put a little bit in the chat, but be sure to include ways that you can engage specifically around the, the, uh, the FAO uh, example that I gave, but we'll, we'll definitely fill that email with lots of, of ideas for how you can engage. And, uh, and then I'll put my email again in the chat. You feel free also any of you to reach out to me directly if you have any Thank other, you so other much. questions. There Thanks. was a very interesting meeting yesterday of the Committee on Food Security. Yes. And yeah. that has been set up under that. So some of those discussions could also be useful. Thank Great. you. Thank you. And Daniel, over to you. Okay. Well, I want to close with a big thanks and also um, some bitter, a bittersweet uh, thanks to our colleague Amrita uh, Gupta, whose last day this is with the Agroecology Fund. And I just a quick thing to say that, you know, we Amrita and I have had the chance to work together for the last year and a half, it's, or a little bit more. It's been just such an enormous pleasure. And I just want to point out, I mean, I'm, Amrita sort of embodies this, you know, young communicator with all this creativity and commitment. I'm the same as Rucha, same as Alethea that's on the call also from Magalaya. And I think that, you know, the work of the Agroecology Fund is to support on the ground grantees and networks of journalists and networks that can tell the story. So I just want to give a huge shout out for Amrita for thanking her for all of her work over the years and saying, Amrita, we're going to continue to pitch you stories and work with you in your new hat on as you continue to work with environmental journalists around oh, the world. Thank you. Most of all, a big thanks and a big thanks to all of you for joining us today. Thanks everyone for joining. Thank you, Rucha, again. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye Thank bye. You so much. Well, Amrita, are you still there? You probably jumped off.